The Australian Medical Association has de delivered a powerful warning today about the encroaching Americanisation of the Australian health system. In a major speech, the AMA's president, Brian Owler, said the government's proposed $7 co-payment also threatens the very, very foundations of the system. According to the AMA, the relationship between doctor and patient is under threat from private insurers. I spoke to Brian Owler a little earlier. Brian Owler, welcome to 7.30. Thank you. Now, you reasserted today the AMA's position, its opposition to the federal government's co-payment. What is it that you object to? Well, there are a range of problems with the proposal. The AMA is not against co-payments per se. In fact, many doctors already charge co-payments. But what we can't support is a proposal that doesn't have protection for vulnerable patients, those that truly can't afford to pay a co-payment, because obviously it impacts uh, more for those patients, but also for patients in terms of prevention and chronic disease management. We need to make sure that we protect those patients and actually promote good health. There are also a number of issues to do with uh, uh, practices and the viability of medical practices, not just in general practice, but also in pathology, particularly diagnostic imaging or radiology. Let me, uh, let me just come in and pick you up on the chronic disease because that's obviously the, um, the, the foundation of the government's argument on sustainability is all about the increase in chronic diseases, especially with an ageing population. It sounds like that makes sense. Is that not a valid argument? Well, no, that's the, the whole point. I mean, you actually want to make sure that people's chronic disease is properly managed. And the best way to do that is actually to encourage people to see their general practitioner. I think general practitioners are actually the answer to the sustainability of the healthcare system. It's about them keeping people well and keeping them out of expensive hospital care. Now, at the same time last week, I think on the same day, both the Treasurer and the Health Minister said on the one hand that there was no room for negotiation and that there was room for negotiation. Now, I know you've been speaking to the government. What have they told you? Is the co-payment up for negotiation? Well, clearly uh, they have a problem in getting this proposal through the Senate. And I uh, also think that there's now an acknowledgement that there are issues with their proposal that probably weren't appreciated before the announcement in the budget. Well, and what are they? Well, I think even things like uh, collecting a co-payment from people in residential aged care facilities, for instance. I mean, many people don't have a wallet, uh, many people with dementia. And we already have a problem with getting GPs into residential aged care facilities to actually provide care to those patients. So I think a lot of those issues to do with health policy, a lot of those issues to do with the practicalities of this proposal weren't properly appreciated. So the Prime Minister has asked us to come back to him with a proposal that the AMA could stand by. You said today that it was the Prime Minister himself who asked you to go away and come back with a new proposal. What exactly do you think he's looking for? A change to the figure or a change to the numbers of people who will be um, protected, as it were, from having to pay this? Well, we haven't actually been given any firm advice on that. What he asked us to do was to come up with a proposal that does send, in his words, a price signal. Now, I think probably the better term is to say that we want a proposal that values general practice and encourages people to spend time with their GP for preventative health care and chronic disease management. But, uh, so that's the sort of uh, framework that we want to work in, uh, come back with a proposal that protects vulnerable patients but also values general practice. Just to go to some of the more general arguments you were making today, you, you said that the stage is set for a US-style primary and hospital care system. What is it exactly that you're afraid of? Well, when we talk about managed care in terms of a US-style system, uh, that implies that there's some interference with the doctor-patient relationship. And I talked today about the fundamentals of, of our healthcare system. That, to me, is one of the sacrosanct fundamentals of our healthcare system, the ability of a doctor to actually determine uh, the right investigations and management for a patient without an insurer or a third party uh, giving the yes or no. And so... Uh, uh, what we have now is private health insurers seeking to have a greater role in terms of general practice. Now, there may well be a role for them, but what we don't want to do is have them interfering with the ability of a doctor, for instance, to refer a patient to a particular specialist or undertake a particular investigation. And that is clearly where their private health insurers are going to want to head to. And, and how big is the private health insurer's push in that area? 
Well, I think it's very strong. We've seen Medibank Private uh, running a trial with IPN, which is a practice, a group of practices, uh, particularly based in Queensland, where we've seen Medibank Private um, actually pay IPN a administrative fee so that their patients get priority appointments. Now, as I said today, that might work in one particular trial for that insurer's patients. But if you have multiple insurers doing this, there is a big issue for the equity of access to practice so that you have patients with private health insurance, for instance, being able to get into general practice to, ha to see a GP, where if you don't have private health insurance, you're out in the cold. And that's not the sort of uh, model of care or model of uh, a health care system that we want to see develop in this country. And are you seeing any signs of this creeping into the system as it exists already? You talk about the relationship between the doctor and the patient being sacrosanct. Are there threats to it already? Well, clearly uh, what uh, uh, private health insurers want to do is have a greater say uh, in the way that uh, money is being spent. So we know that there are a group of patients that are frequent flyers, for instance, uh, 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 to our public hospitals or our private hospitals, uh, take up a greater uh, share of the resources of private health insurers. So they have an interest in obviously managing those patients and keeping them out of hospital. But you can see arrangements that might develop where the private health insurer pays a general practice uh, a certain amount of money to manage those patients. But it will be, of course, about controlling costs there as well. And the way that they do that is by instructing those GPs to refer patients only to their providers, uh, making sure that they send people for tests only to their providers so that they control costs. Now, we, we're not yet at this stage, but this is the sort of thing that we are uh, can expect uh, to be looked at in the future. And I know the government has asked private health insurers to uh, provide them with information about how they see their role developing in terms of uh, general practice and, and primary care. And did you get the impression from your discussions with the government that they were sympathetic to that incursion, if you like, of the private insurers into those areas of doctor selection and so on? Well, we've already seen signals from the Minister to say that there is a greater role uh, potentially for private health insurers in primary care and general practice. And although the, pri uh, the Minister and private health insurers have all said, no, we're not going to have a US-style managed health care system, well, it is all about, uh, it's not the name, it's actually about what happens on the ground and the sort of changes that come along with these sorts of uh, proposals. So that's the thing that I want people to be aware of, the sort of thing that we need to keep our eyes open to so that these proposals don't gain traction, they don't come from left field and we end up going down a path we can't ever reverse out of. A long way to go in this debate. Brian Owler, thank you very much for joining 7.30. Thank you. Pleasure. The number of